Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Taking Your Next Step podcast from Collegians for Christ. Through each episode, we will journey together, focusing on knowing what you believe and why you believe it. If you are eager, like I am, to strengthen your faith and take your next step now by joining us in today's episode. So we're continuing to walk through and be more detailed in our explanation of why you cannot lose your salvation. We're referencing back to John 15, uh, where it talked about the branches are removed and the branch, the withered branches are gathered and burned. And people would reference that to say, hey, this means you can lose your salvation. But those are obscure passages that don't necessarily say salvation. And we've already talked about that two episodes ago. You can go back and listen. But now we're building the case or giving you five reasons why you cannot lose your salvation. And we said never use the obscure to interpret the obvious. And so what we're doing is taking the obvious in Scripture, what Scripture very clearly says about salvation. That way we can then interpret the obscure. We can take what we understand about salvation, then look in John chapter 15 to know what Jesus was talking about. And so we've already already in our previous episode said you cannot lose your salvation for two reasons. One, salvation is a gift from God. A gift cannot be earned and a gift cannot be taken back. That is the essence of a, uh, of a gift. And since salvation is not received based on your behavior or works, then it cannot be removed based on your behavior or works. And then we saw secondly that a believer is sealed by the Holy Spirit. At the moment of salvation, we're sealed and that seal, the Holy Spirit, is a promise that God gave is the Holy Spirit of promise. He promised us his return and he promised us uh, eternal life. And it says we're sealed until the day of redemption. And that's when Jesus returns. So in order for you to lose your salvation, an unbreakable seal promised by God who the scripture says cannot lie would have to be broken. And nowhere does the, the scripture talk about this. So let's jump into our last three here. Thirdly, a believer is adopted into the family of God. And we can read this in Romans chapter 8. We can read this in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 25, and then chapter 4, 4 through 7. If you're trying to make some notes and study through this, I believe this is something that we all need to understand personally, but it is the most frequent question I get over the years by people, well-meaning people. People think that you're good outweighs your bad, whether you're trying to witness, whether somebody thinks they can lose their salvation, they think there's certain sins. There's all sorts of teachings that come up. And so knowing this or having a reference point uh, can help you, I think, as you dialogue and conversate with coworkers, classmates, whatever the case is. So Romans chapter 8, verse number 14, scripture says this, it says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So here you have people who are sealed and it says, those that are led, those that have the Holy Spirit, you are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It says, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. <clears throat> and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And so as you think about being adopted into the family of God, what does that mean? Well, adoption is a permanent decision. You see, at salvation, a person is born again, or they're born into God's family. Uh, uh, Nicodemus had it well. He said, when Jesus told him to be born again in John chapter 3, he said, what on earth are you talking about? How does that happen? And we kind of laugh when he says, do I go back into my mother's womb to be born again? I mean, he's thinking logically here, but there's a spiritual birth that occurs. And when that occurs, we are born, just like when you were born, you were born into your family, whether you love them, hate them, like them, whatever, you were born into your family. And so when you're born again spiritually, you're born into God's family. So at the moment of salvation, we are adopted into God's family. And then we cannot be unborn and then be born again. And then be unborn and born again again. And then become unborn and then be born again again again. It doesn't work that way. You see, adoption is a permanent decision that God makes, but it's also a permanent position. What does it mean to be adopted? It means to be placed into a family as a son or daughter with all the rights and privileges of the natural born. You're adopted in never to be separated. You are permanent in that family, your permanent position. How do we know? Because here in our passage, it says we are heirs. And if so, if we're children of God, we're in his family, then we're heirs of God. 
And the heir is one who's entitled to possess an inheritance. What is the believer's inheritance? It's access to God. It is the Holy Spirit. It's the promise of eternal life. And as the children of God, we have the promise of a permanent standing in God's family. I think it's beautiful to know that we are adopted. Ephesians talks about who we are in Christ. And we are adopted into God's family. We are the children of God. So if you could lose your salvation, we would have to be removed kicked out or disowned from God's family. Tell me a verse or a passage that talks about you and I being removed from God's family, from being the children of God to not the children of God, to being reborn again to become the children of God. Nowhere does Scripture talk about that or talk about what it takes to get back into Jesus's fam- or into God's family. So therefore, we would say you cannot lose your salvation based on the fact that you're adopted into the family of God. And then fourthly, a believer's salvation is eternal. We go to John 3, 16, right? One of the most famous passages in probably all of Scripture. You'll see it at baseball games. You'll you'll hear it. You'll see it on shirts and different things. But it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But we keep going. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Then it says, As he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So in our passage here, who has everlasting life in these verses? Well, it's the person who believes. We see that he that believeth on him is not condemned. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means they possess everlasting life. Now, if we skip down to verse number 36, this helps us. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there's two different people here. There's the person who has eternal life and the person who doesn't. But it's very interesting, verse 36 says that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It doesn't say we'll get it, we'll wait for it. It says you have it. Do you understand that eternal life is not a future possession you're waiting to receive? You do not get salvation once you get to heaven. You possess eternal life the moment you receive God's free gift of salvation. So eternal life is a present possession. And eternal life is what? It's eternal. Eternal life or everlasting life simply means that the gift of salvation is eternal. This means you possess salvation how long? You possess it eternally. Now, if you could lose your salvation at any time, it would not be salvation. It could not be referred to, I'm sorry, be referred to as eternal life. It would have to be referred this way, daily life. If you lost it daily or weekly or monthly or six-month or three-year life, But it could never be referred to as eternal life because we see it's a present possession. If you could lose your salvation, then you don't call it eternal life. You call it three-month life. You call it two-month life, whatever the case is. But you and I understand that salvation is eternal. And then lastly here, a believer can know they possess salvation. I think this is so comforting. When I walk uh, students through this and help them to see if they're struggling to uh, with assurance of their salvation or to even understand if they can know, I even have some people to think, well, it's prideful to say that you know you're going to heaven, and I get kind of their perspective. We don't want to be prideful. It's not prideful. It's called confidence. And so the Bible speaks about receiving eternal life. We see that. God's Word tells us that we can know with 100% assurance that we have have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you. Who are the you? They're believers. That's who he wrote to. Unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, so we know it's believers. Watch this, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you possess it. It's a present possession, not that you're waiting for it, not that it'll be in the future, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So this is not pride, but this is confidence. And God's Word tells exactly how to receive the gift of eternal life. Now, the Bible does not speak about losing eternal life. As clear as God is on how to get salvation, think about this now. God is very clear. There's tons of verses throughout Scripture about how you and I receive salvation. The Bible does not speak on what it takes to lose that salvation or what it would take to get it back. 
It, it would always be some obscure passage that someone would point to. But if God is so clear about salvation and how important it is and how he gave his son for the world for this purpose and that he's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, do you not think God would spell out very clearly, very obviously, this is what it takes to lose your salvation? Because he's very clear, this is what it takes to receive salvation. You believe on Jesus Christ. It's not of works. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. He tells us very clearly what we do to possess eternal life. But nowhere in Scripture, obviously, we have a passage like John 15 where it talks about the the unfruitful branches removed. We've already talked about that. But if we use the obvious to interpret the obscure, then we'll understand there's nothing in there to talk about how you lose your salvation. Where is the line? And what do you do? What do you have to do to cross it? It's not spelled out. What sin is it? And how many times do you have to commit that sin? It's not spelled out. What do you have to do to get your salvation back, to be reborn again, to get the seal again? You see, none of that is spelled out. How many times can you lose it? None of that is spelled out. Why? Because you cannot lose your salvation. So as clear as God is about getting salvation, surely he would be equally clear about losing it and what it takes to get it back. But this is not given in Scripture. Why? Because it's not there. Why? Because you cannot lose your salvation. So think about this with me. In order for you to lose your salvation, God would have to do this. He would have to take back what he called a free gift. He would have to break a promise and lie to you. He would have to break an unbreakable seal, kick you out of his family and disown you, and take back eternal life, therefore not making it eternal. This is why I would say, scripturally speaking, you cannot lose your salvation, and why John chapter 15, where the branch is removed or the withered branch is gathered and burned in the fire, does not mean you can lose your salvation. Thank you for taking the time to listen. If this podcast has been helpful to you, please share it with a friend or subscribe to stay up to date on the latest episodes. You can connect with Collegians for Christ online for more information and resources at cfccampusministry.com.